Ortega has an opportunity to kick the San Diego Chargers into the AFC Championship game. The snap, it's down, he hits it, it's up! It's no good! But Ortega, who feels, I'm sure, just broken about that play, hoping that he'll get another chance. chance. For most, missing a winning kick in one of the greatest games in NFL history would be a bitter disappointment. But for Rolf Bernerska, it was simply another step in a journey that began in 1978. The second season of my career, I came down with what I thought was the flu. I had fever, I had abdominal crampiness. There were three or four other guys in the team that had it as well, but theirs went away and mine progressed. That season was one of the most statistically successful of my career, but there should have been a little footnote that said the young kicker was dying. At the time, it was very difficult to grasp just how sick Rolf was getting. Oh, hey, your stomach's upset. You'll, you'll be fine. Wait, well, you had too much to drink last night or a bad burger? We weren't ready for somebody to be that sick. Benerska was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, a chronic digestive disorder in which the cause and cure are unknown. Rolf suffered in silence for over a year as treatments failed to control the disease. On a flight home from New England, I collapsed on the plane. And my colon had perforated. And I needed uh, surgery, and, and there were complications. And six days later, I needed a second surgery. And I woke up weighing 123 pounds with two ostomy bags on my side, not sure if I'd see the next day, and frankly, not sure if I really cared to. Shortly after his release from the hospital, with his body frail and his spirit weakened, Rolf was invited to a game. When news of Benerska's visit reached the Chargers locker room, it was fitting that Louis Kelcher, a Bunyan-esque defensive lineman from Texas with a heart to match, convinced Coach Don Coriel to allow Rolf to be honorary captain. Let's do this thing. You know, let's let the world know that we love him, that we're behind him. I was worried that I couldn't walk from the sidelines to the middle of the field. And Louis said, if you can't walk, we'll just have to carry you. And as I walked out, the stadium spontaneously stood and applauded. I had no idea that they had been following me. And I, by the time I got to the middle field, I was just in tears. Watching Big Louie holding hands with a little kicker. It's pretty neat. All of a sudden, it was just a thrill to be alive. That profoundly changed my recovery. And it would give me encouragement to keep trying. With support from fans, family, and friends, Bernerska returned to the Chargers in 1980. A year later, Rolf's courage would be tested again in one of the greatest games ever played. In many ways, that game was like a metaphor for my life. When it really didn't look like I was going to live, I was spared and given a second chance. In this game, a kicker misses a kick in, in, in overtime. They never get a second chance. The 29-yard field goal try to win it. The snap. It is down. Remarkably, I was given a second chance and was lucky to make it. That made me realize the same opportunity exists in life. The question then becomes, how are you going to use it? For over two decades, Rolf has dedicated himself to helping all walks of life and has raised millions of dollars for endangered animals. In 1987, Rolf's life took an unexpected turn when he became host of Wheel of Fortune. While Benerska never felt comfortable in the Hollywood spotlight, he has always felt at home as a humble philanthropist. For Rolf, each day is another chance to touch someone's life. I go back to Rolf always preaching. It's the journey, not the destination. And we're thinking, who would put somebody in a situation like this to experience this journey? Why? Maybe that was all part of the master plan. I heard somebody say once that wisdom is a tough teacher. She always gives the exam first and teaches the lessons later. And once you hang in there, then the lessons come out. He's had that opportunity, and he's made the most to share as much of him as he can. And well, that's what you hope to do in life. And he's done it. Welcome to another unbelievable edition of Uncommon Engineering. The more I do this, the more I realize that I don't know anything, and I've done very little, and there's so many amazing people out there to learn from. And uh, we have yet another special person on today, a UC Davis alum, NFL player, has a tremendous story, soccer player, football player, father and immigrant, goes on to be a great player in the National Football League, has some health issues, then circles back around and becomes a health patient 
advocate. Uh, welcome our special guest to the show today, Uncommon Engineering. Our alum, we're so proud of him, San Diego Charger Hall of Fame kicker, Rolf Benershka. Hey, Dan, thanks for having me on. Super. Not fun to think back on all those things you just <laughs> talked about. That was a long time ago, but when you get to look back at your life, we have had the privilege of doing some really special things. Yeah, and I just kind of want to peel that onion a little bit, Rolf. I just think there's so many people in so many areas that could benefit from your, uh, your, your story. I do want to kick it all the way back. Let's just kind of go back to your parents and your dad, who I believe was a German immigrant, was also into pathology. Uh, you started out on the East Coast and ventured out West. And I'm just interested in how your dad and how your father and his, his med uh, medical background just talk about your background and what he brought to the table. Yeah, so my dad was an, uh, raised in Germany, uh, actually during World War II. He was a medic in the German army, um, hated the whole experience, was a passionate physician, ended up at the Battle of the Bulge where he got hepatitis and it got him off the front, which is probably what saved his life. He ended up being in a hospital for for three months and it was just about to go back to the front, got another infection, kept him off in the hospital for another month and gets released and is literally on his way back to the, to the front and the war ends. And he's spared and he's set to take over his father's business. His father, had start, his father was a physicist, but had started a laundry to make money. And the laundry was actually quite successful, but dad had no desire to do that. Fortunately, an older sister was married, so he, he took over the business. And Dad said, I want to leave. I want to go be a physician, and I can't do it here. I'm going to go to America. So within two years after the war was over, he finds his way to America, stops in the UK for three months to kind of learn English, ends up in New York, gets a job delivering boxes. One day sees a sign, a physician is looking for a displaced physician as a partner. Dad goes, I'm a displaced physician. <laughs> finds his way to this hospital. It turns out the guy happened to be German looking for a partner. And he hires dad on the spot. And dad is very bright. Notices after being there a few weeks that the guy kept sending slides into New York from Teaneck, New Jersey. Dad goes, what are you doing? He goes, well, I don't know how to read slides. So I send him my pathologist friend in New York. Dad goes, well, I don't know how to do that. So he starts to read this guy's slides. And the guy goes, you're really bright you need to finish up and get your degree. I'm gonna send you to my buddy who runs the pathology department at Harvard. Dad goes, where's Harvard? <laughs> so he sends him to Harvard. He's there three months, the Korean War breaks out. Dad's boss essentially goes, Dr. B, you're in charge. So dad's like, I guess I'm in charge. So he finishes his medical school training there and meets my mom who happened to be a nurse. I get born in Boston, lived there till I'm five. And then he gets recruited to Dartmouth to help start, set up the pathology department at the medical school. Shares that department. And that's where my youth is. I spend my formative years from five to 15 in a little town called Hammer, New Hampshire, where Dartmouth College is. Ivy League town. All of my classmates were you know, sons and daughters of, of college professors. And I was a hockey player, a ski racer, tennis player, soccer player and deeply embedded into the four seasons of sports and love the wildlife outdoors. My ninth grade year, we won the state championship uh, in hockey. And that's the sport I thought I would play. Until one day, uh, Christmas, I was 14. Uh, he pulls my sister aside. She comes back 10, 10 minutes later with a sign that says, California or bust. Wait, what are you talking about? Dad goes, well, I accepted a job at a new medical school. They're just starting. UC San Diego, we're leaving when the school year's over. I, well, you didn't ask us. You know, my brother was a really good skier. You know, likely could have skied in the Olympics. I love the, the New England sports. And here we were going from, you know, conservative New England to, you know, what we call the land of fruits and nuts, California. Are you kidding me? And, uh, but he did it because he was committed to joining this really turned on group of research scientists at this brand new medical school, UC San Diego. So that was how I got to the West Coast. Crazy. What was his involvement and or your mom's in their approach to you in sports and playing a lot of sports? And obviously you were a talented student. I mean, what kind of influence did they have in that? So great, great question. So back East, they 
you know, they, they taught us to ski and we had access to skates. Um, we skated on the ponds and got involved in sports. Um, when we moved to California, my dad was doing all of his work and parents weren't like we are today. Literally, my, my parents actually never saw me play football until I was in the pros. And I didn't resent it at the time. They were busy doing their things and we did our things. And there was not any focus on it. There was no pushing us. We just did it because we loved to do it. I will tell you, um, I had a passion for wildlife. So let me, let me back up. So when we moved to California, all the sports I loved, they didn't have. They, there was no soccer team. There was no, there was no hockey team. There was no ski racing team. And the tennis team was the best in the nation. And I, in 10th grade, when we moved out, when I moved out, I was 5'4", 107 pounds. I couldn't play on the tennis team. We started a soccer team my junior year, and it was just when soccer style kicking was getting vogue. And I remember vividly one day after practice, some of the football guys came and said, have you guys ever kicked a football? And three of us raised our hands and I was one of them. Now, the truth is the only football I ever kicked was walking home from school in Hanover, we crossed the Dartmouth athletic fields and we would practice kicking and throwing lacrosse balls. So we started having a kicking competition and don't tell anybody, Dan, but kicking a football is really very easy if you can kick a soccer ball. So I was the last guy standing at the end of this little informal competition. What I didn't realize is there was a guy like you, the head coach was over there on the side. I didn't know that. He came over to me and says, why don't you come and kick your senior year? I'm about 135 pounds now. I go, I don't know, coach. He goes, no, well, here's, here's four balls. Why don't you think about it? Anyway, I get talked into it by my friends and I kick my senior year in high school. And we did not have a great team. So we had a lot of chances to kick. Kicking is easy, and all of a sudden, I get scholarship offers to Stanford, Cal, USC, San Diego State, New Mexico State. So I go to my dad. I go, Dad, you know, they want to pay me way to go to Stanford. You know, what do you think? And dad goes, well, That's not why you go to college. Why would you do that? <laughs> and I'm going, Yeah, you're right. I mean, we didn't grow up with a television, um, so I said, Yeah, you're right. And I had a passion for wildlife. So the only school I applied to was Davis because they had a zoology department. And that's what I wanted to study. Crazy. So you make your way uh, to Davis and you're a soccer player, not a football player. Neither. How did that transition happened. Neither, Dan. I went to Davis as a student. What happened is classic Davis, right? I'm there for a week and I get a phone call in the dorms from Jim Soaker your mentor and my hero. Uh, and I'm going, well, what, what are you calling me? He goes, well, did you used to kick it? And I go, yeah, but who are you? And he goes, oh, I'm the head football coach. And actually, I just got berated on the phone by John Robinson, the head coach at USC, suggesting we're paying players to come to Davis. And Stoker goes, come on, John, you know better. We're division two. There's no, there's no athletic scholarship. If you remember, Dan, our tuition was $212.50 a quarter. So no, they weren't paying us to come there. So Robinson goes, well, you gotta be doing something illegal because we recruited this kicker really hard and he went to Davis and not Southern Cal. What are you doing? And Soaker goes, we didn't sign a kicker, but what's his name? So he tracks me down and he talks me into playing football my freshman year and he fundamentally changes my life. Jim Soaker, I owe all of this to Jim Soaker. How, how did he track your name down? How did he come by that? So when Robinson said we recruited this kicker, he didn't choose us. He chose Davis. So goes, I don't, don't know who you're talking about. What's his name? He goes into the, you know, wherever you guys find it out, who the new freshmen are, and he tracks me down. Crazy. And that was the beginning of it. And, and then, so I played my, my freshman year. But I also, as you know, Davis is so strong in intramural sports. I played bunch of intramural sports including soccer I played you know we had a co-ed team we had a dorm team and and pretty soon I find I'm playing actually with or against a bunch of guys on the varsity and they're great guys and I, I realize how much I miss the sport and they go why don't you come play soccer you know we, we'd have a great time and I said you know what I think I'm going to do that the problem is in college soccer and football are both in the same season so my sophomore year, I went to Coach Soger and said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit. You got, you know, 
I, you got you can find another kicker. I'm going to go play soccer. I, and he could have said, you know, yeah, go, go ahead. We, but he didn't. He said, let me talk to the soccer coach, Will Lauder at the time. Anyway, they worked it out where I could play both sports in the same season and did that for the next three years and just had the greatest experience at Davis that a person could possibly have. Yeah, we still are kind of in that, in that vein. We have a couple guys who are going to play baseball or want to play baseball. We actually have a kid that's coming that's a national finalist in uh, steer wrestling. He's a rodeo guy. Wow. But I'm like, hey, I'm all, I'm all for that. The more you can do, the better. Have at it. I'm, I'm totally good. I think, it, I think it's great. It helps you be well-rounded. So then you take your career. I think you're picked in the 12th round. 12th round. How about this by the Raiders? You take by the Raiders, but then you go to San Diego. So tell us about that journey. So I get drafted by the Raiders, and I go there the year after they won the Super Bowl. It was 1977. Uh, John Madden was a coach. Kenny Stave was a quarterback. Cliff Branch, you know, Gene Upshaw, great players. Ray Guy was, a, you know, the all-world punter. And they were the baddest team in the league on every level. <laughs> However you define bad, they were really good, and they were just badass guys. And I'm this little kid from UC Davis, a kicker, right? You know, I'm going. But I realized quickly, Dan, a week into it, that I was more qualified to be there than most of the other people. And I say that with humility in that, look, they played at SC and Alabama and Michigan and these big schools, but I got a, a real education at Davis. And I had real life world experiences because of the way I was raised. Sports was not the only thing I did. It was a love of mine, but my dad, you know, traveled internationally. We went with him oftentimes. So I had this different view of the world. And, and so I felt qualified to be there. And it only took me a little while to realize I can kick with these guys. Absolutely. Now, whether or not I could make it is another story. And actually, um, it's a funny story how I ended up in San Diego, but I ended up in San Diego five days before the first game. They just had to release a kicker in San Diego to make room for me. And I'm coming from the dreaded Raiders. And our first game is back up against the Raiders. It was bizarre. I felt like this out of body experience with this. I kicked the opening kickoff in that first game and never get on the field again. We lose 24, nothing. Our guys are scared to death of the Raiders. Um, and that was the beginning but we were just getting good with the Chargers. We had a quarterback named Dan Fouts who was holding out that first year. The second year we brought in Coach Coriel as our, our head coach and he brought with him this offensive way of looking at football that changed, it's really known as the West Coast Office and started with him and Walsh took it from there. And, but we would, we averaged, you know, 130 yards more than any other team. We'd, we'd score 40 points, hope we had the ball last because if we had the ball last, we felt we could win. We didn't have a great defense, so we had the ball. We were good. And as a kicker, I was in the middle of it in my hometown. I mean, it was surreal, really, what was happening to me. So you're saying you were scared of the Raiders, and then you alluded to it a little bit. But what I'm interested because, again, in my heyday when I was younger, and I, I know we do have Tim Plow, our offensive coordinator. He's a diehard Charger fan. In fact, he, when he heard you were going to be on, he was like, can I get on, please? I want to talk to Rolf. Um, his dad, actually, season ticket holder, never missed a Charger game like in 40-some years until they moved to, to L.A. But it's interesting how you go from this team that's being scared to really being a dominant – you guys were a dominant team in there. And what are some of those other factors – you got the offense, but what are some of those other factors that led to that just change in mentality? That's a great question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attribute it to leadership. So it starts with leadership. When we brought in Don Coriel and Dan Fouts, Dan Fouts is maybe the most competitive person I've ever been around. I've been around Tiger Woods. I would maybe argue Tiger's head, but, but Dan was right there. It didn't matter who. It didn't matter if he threw six interceptions. He was still throwing. It just didn't matter to him like it matters to most of us. And with Coach Coriel and the schemes that they created, we knew we were better than anybody. We had Kellen Winslow and Charlie Joyner, Wes Chandler, John Jefferson, Chuck Muncie in the backfield. I mean, we had this amazing group of talented offensive players. And with the scheme that Coriel had, we didn't think anybody could, nobody could stop us. So we had this supreme confidence and we had this gutsy leader 
that nobody intimidated. And it just fed all of us. Um, I would say a lot of football players are Indians. When you have a great chief, the Indians follow. And we had guys that just had self-belief and it's like what the Raiders had. When they were so dominant, they scared other teams with their, the way they played, their swagger. And we loved it in San Diego to be able to match them. And we loved those games. They were always just battles. And, uh, but it was leadership change and then confidence that came with our ability. Yeah. So then you get going, kind of getting your uh, legs figuratively and literally underneath you. And then out of left field, kind of start having some stomach problems. Talk us through that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, so first of all, when I get drafted, my father, you know, gets a call from a colleague, medical colleague, and Dr. B, congratulations, Sir Rolf was drafted. There's a pause on my dad's end of the phone. He goes, drafted? I thought the war was over. Are they still drafting people? So we had a lot to learn, right? My dad, particularly my mom, this was all new. And they're going to pay you to kick a football? When are you going to get a real job? Do something worthwhile with your life. And I, I'm only half kidding, not even half kidding. That was the way it was. Um, but it was this whole new world for me that I got opened up to and had success my rookie season, started my second season and got sick, diagnosed with Crohn's disease. But you understand better than most, there are real football players and then there are kickers. And I, I'm not going to pretend I'm a real football player. I'm a kicker. I was a specialist. I was good at what I did, but I didn't do what everybody else does. I'm not getting concussed or tearing my knees or my shoulders. And there's only one kicker. And I loved what I was doing. So I kind of kept my head down and played, getting sicker and sicker and sicker, bloody diarrhea, bad abdominal cramps. The last month of the season, I was literally fed intravenously through an uh, IV line in my neck. Couldn't eat any food. But if you look at the 10 years of my career, statistically, it was one of the best. But I was getting sicker and sicker. Uh, How did that happen, Rolf? How was it the best? You know, so much of kicking is technique. It's not so much strength. And... I just, I just, you know, ended up just, you kind of do what you do and you can't read between the lines, but everybody knew, I knew I was sicker and sicker. Anyway, that off season tried every traditional therapy, non-traditional bio, biofeedback, acupuncture, changed my diet, convinced myself I was getting better. Now my third season, we're preseason picks to go deep in the playoffs. We had a chance to go to the Super Bowl. We opened in Seattle and I remember I kicked four field goals and we're in the locker room afterwards and everybody's, you know, celebrating. We're on our way, and I'm sitting in front of my locker crying because I know I cannot survive 50 Morgan. It's like somebody has a knife in my abdomen and they're turning it. Well, I didn't. Uh, three games later, we just played New England. I'm on a cross-country uh, flight home on the team plane. I collapse. They land the plane. I have to have an emergency surgery. They take part of my colon out, and six days later, I need a second surgery, and I wake up in the same hospital where my dad was working 65 pounds below my playing weight with two ostomy bags on my side to collect my waist and my doctors telling my dad his colleagues that i likely wouldn't survive the night i was septic i really should have died and i didn't die i think the lord visited me that night i survived that night and then i spent five and a half weeks in the icu and every day it was a challenge staying ahead of my infection. I got great medical care. And two more weeks in the hospital. And now two months in, I get released from my parents. I look around, you know, what just happened? And why did I live? From my perspective, Dan, I, I didn't see any reason to live. I love sports of all kinds. I'm going, I'll never ski again, play tennis, go to the water. I've got bags on my side. I'm making my living as a professional athlete. I'm going, that's, that's never going to happen again either, for sure. And by the way, I'm 24 years old and I like girls. You know, that's not happening. I mean, Lord, why didn't you just take me? And he didn't take me. And now I had to figure out how to live with ostomy bags. And I went through this remarkable journey of that. Nobody was talking about it. I learned later there are 100,000 ostomy surgeries done a year. Everyone is life-changing for us. But it's the quintessential closet illness. And so I had to Figure out one. And what, one of the things I was encouraged to do was read some books written by some POWs 
that had survived Vietnam prisoner war camps. You know these stories. And what they did, I began to apply to my life. They talked about, for example, this is the same with athletes. Right? It's how do you, for, first of all, it's change the mission. The mission for them was to survive and get home um, with honor. But they had to do a few things. So the first thing they had to do was they had to break time down into bite sized increments. For them, it was how do I survive the day? Literally, I can't worry about tomorrow. And a week from now is an eternity away. So that became mine. How do I survive the day? The second thing is they, they, they set these small achievable goals. So every day they did, for example, you know, 100 push ups, 300 sit ups. They walked their cell six feet, turned around, six feet, turned around, you know, 50 times. And then they memorized the name of everybody in their camp in case they got released, they could tell who was there every day, every day. And then they talked about the need to accept help from others. If you read any of those books, whoever the highest ranking commander was that was a prisoner of war, he was in charge of everybody else. So if they heard Bill in cell block seven was struggling, giving up, lost 50 pounds because of dysentery, the word got out, we got to help Bill. So people would tap on the walls in code. They would leave notes by the latrines. They would cough in code. Hang in there, Bill. They're not going to be, come on, we're in this together. Don't give up. And they would get each other through. And I had to learn that. He said the last thing, they, they, they learned that they had this indomitable spirit. I'm going to suggest God gives every one of us this indomitable spirit, which most of us never discover because it lays latent. It's dormant. It's, if you imagine, you know, we kind of drive through life between the guardrails. We may hit a bump, hit a bounce, bounce off. But it's not until you crash, you find yourself figuratively in the ditch, you you, 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 it was a terrible divorce. You, 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 the loss prematurely of a, of a child. There was a suicide. There was one of these just horrific things that life throws at you, all of us. In my case, an illness leaves me in the ditch going, what just happened? And where do I go from here? And it's there you get to discover that you have greater creativity, greater courage, greater ability to, 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 to persevere than you ever thought you had. And then it's a choice. Every one of us, patients, people that go through challenges in life, you can choose to stay bitter. And I would suggest I did for a long time. This was unfair. I was 24 years old. My life was ahead of me. I'm playing my hometown. Our team's great. I had success. Shouldn't happen. Yes. And so why me is ultimately the wrong question. But you go there for a while or you choose better. So bitter or better. And when you start to choose better, things start to happen. Doors start to open up. You get a chance to move on with your life. You learn from these things. And interestingly, because I've read a ton about this, most of, not most of us, trauma like this either buries people or it changes people. And there's a huge percentage of us that wouldn't trade the trauma we just went through for how it changed us. I lived the rest of my life changed as a result of this illness, which was horrific. I wouldn't want to, it was as bad as it could be. But it changed me in every way. And I got to live the rest of my days changed. And I've found that having spoken out of thousands of patients and people have gone through different traumas, that that's the case. But it's always your choice. How long are you going to stay bitter? When are you going to choose to get better? And so I think that's true in athletics. It's true when you deal with any kind of adversity. What we're going through right now as a nation uh, with COVID and all the racial disparity, all of those issues we get to wrestle with. And and these are discussions worth having. I know uh, you now uh, do many things. You're in charge of, I think it's health legacy. Is that what your organization legacy is? Legacy health strategies, yeah. Legacy yep. health strategies. And I'm interested that something piqued my interest, the four questions that every patient wants to know. Could you expound upon that, please? Yeah. So in, in the course of, I created, I've created several programs. One was for ostomy patients. I ran it for 40 years. And the goal was to find stories that we could sort of hold up as examples for people because we learned that if you have hope, you can do almost anything. Without hope, you can do almost nothing. And the hope for patients comes from people who've gone ahead of them and the illness or surgery in our case didn't bury them, but it gave them a new, new chance. So in speaking to literally thousands of patients, I learned that there are four questions every patient has that are never spoken. Dan, I would argue they're the same four questions every one of your players asks you. 
and you probably asked them, but they're never spoken. And I've watched it played out when we got new coaches. The first question is, can I trust you? Trust right now in our country is lost. We don't trust the media. We don't trust the church. We don't trust big government. We don't trust big pharma. Through green scandal and other things, we've lost trust. Everything's become politicized, depending on what party you're in. You look at an event differently and you politicize it. So tr how, trust, can I trust you? As a patient, I wanna know. We sit there with our arms crossed until we trust. So can I trust? Second is, are you committed to excellence? Are you committed to excellence? And I'll expound on that in a minute. The third question is, do you care about me? Do you know anything about my background? You know, I'm a 24 year old kid whose life was just ripped upside down, career taken away, scared to death of the future. And the last question is, is there hope? Let me share a story. I watched Bobby Ross come into the Chargers when the team had been four and 12, three straight seasons. He comes in, we have a, a, a quarterback, um, who is, is going to take the, the team and he come, Bobby Ross comes in the very first preseason game, this quarterback goes down and tears his knee. And there's this big collective groan in San Diego. Oh my gosh, four and 12, I wish, maybe two and 14 if we're lucky. But Bobby Ross takes the microphone after the game in the post game and he goes, I know what you're thinking. I've been here before, we're going to figure this thing out. And he gets off the stage, climbs in the plane, and as they're flying back, the players are always at the back of the plane, he goes to check on the players, and they're kind of yucking it up. They're having a good old time. And he has a meeting of money. He goes, this is unacceptable. This is not how we do it. We got our butts kicked. We lost our quarterback. We've been 4 and 12, 3. We're changing it right now. And he demanded excellence. He said, we're going to do this 10 times. And if we don't do it right after 10, we're going to do it 12 times. And all of us are going, instead of going, fearing that, we're going, yes, somebody else wants to win as bad as we do. In fact, he's demanding that. Over the next, we lose the next three preseason games. I wasn't actually on the team. I just what It was after I played. So they've not gone 0-4. But he's answering their first question, building trust. They traded for a third string overweight quarterback named Stan Humphreys from Washington. Humphrey comes in, he can't hit the proverbial ocean if he falls out the boat, right? He's throwing it one way, the receivers are cutting another way. I mean, it's embarrassing. Never once in the press did he say, you know what? We would have won that game if our quarterback had hit a wide open receiver. He didn't. If you watch practice, every now and then he'd walk over to Stan, he goes, Stan, you just keep pitching it. We're going to start running the right routes. We're going to figure this thing out. You just keep throwing it. So he didn't hang any players out to dry and he's earning their trust. So he's answering the question, trust. He's demanding excellence. And then at the same time, he's putting his arm around and he's, he's getting to know Stan, what's important to him, who he is, what his background is. And it's not just Stan, it's everybody else. They lose the first two games of the season. They're now 0-6 under his watch, right? I mean, they're writing stuff in the paper, Dan. You know, the players were ordering dominoes. So they only would pack to talk to one guy. It was the pizza delivery guy, not everybody else they'd run into, right? And you know those kind of... I've been there. Th you've been there. Everybody's been there in life. The third game, they pick a ball off in the end zone to win the game. The next game, they block a punt. The next game, they, they hit a field goal. The next day, they throw a... Now they go on a roll, and I think they go 11-5, and five and they go in the playoff, and that starts the run under Bobby Ross because he was able to answer those four questions, lived it out, and the team subordinated all their personal issues to the, to the good of this entity that was thriving. It was the coolest thing to watch. I'll tell you a side story. When I had lost my job once, my wife, God bless her, she, she wrote letters to every NFL coach because she's like, here's this young, passionate guy. He wants to coach, willing to do anything. Bobby Rice write, Bob, Bobby Ross writes her back, like three-page letter. Unbelievable. He was like, I was so moved by your letter. I had to write back. I don't know exactly what to say. I still have it. Oh. Yeah, Bobby Ross, amazing. So, so, Dan, you're that kind of a leader. You're authentic. You care about your players. You're, you're passionate. 
you're driven to demand excellence, but you're not lording it over anybody. You're getting in line with what the players want. That it's those four questions: trust, commitment, to excellence, care about them as people, and and give them hope that we can win. And yeah, I mean, that was Soaker. That, that's the, the the Aggie way. I was just gonna say I've carried this with me forever, and you probably heard this, but he told it. He told me this when we were co when I was a young coach here, but. The, there's a Chinese saying, I've said I don't know how to say it in Chinese, but the worst kind of leader is everyone that hate, that they, they hate them. The second one is everybody loves them, but the best kind of leader is the one that says we could have done it without them. Interesting. You know, Interesting. it's, just, it's yeah. so counterintuitive. But, yeah, it's T -T -T take to me back to your uh, relationship to uh, Jim Soaker, Hall of Fame coach, 20 championships in a row, a lot of great people. Just expound upon your, what, you, what you got from Coach Soaker. So I would say my relationship actually developed more when I was done with the game. But while I was playing, there were a few attributes about Jim that were remarkable to me. First of all, his sort of quiet demeanor. Like there was no, when things got tough, he didn't change who he was. He was composed, thoughtful, um, cared about people. And the other thing he was, he was always curious. He always wanted to learn more. It's not like he knew it all. I mean, every off season, He'd go visit the Dallas Cowboys, or when I played, he'd come down to the Chargers, and he he was allowed to come in and sit in the meetings and learn and pick pick uh, the brains of of these NFL coaches. So when he came back, he would bring new stuff with him all the time. So there were teams that we just flat beat because we outcoached them. They were bigger than us, they had better talent, but we beat them because we outcoached them, and that was due directly to Jim. Where I think I got to know Jim the best was when my eligibility was done and there was a lot of sort of interest from the NFL and me and a couple other guys on the team they started to come around and so we got to spend more time together as we went through this kind of for the first time together and he was also he was a renaissance man he didn't just talk or know about football he was curious about art and theater and and read a lot and was a student of other sports which is the way my dad was and I think I wish I got more characteristics of my dad, but I got his curiosity and his desire to learn about all kinds of things. And so we would have deep discussions, philosophical discussions about lots of different things. We loved to play tennis. We ended up skiing a lot together and we just, I just had respect for him. I was, you know, I'll forever be grateful um, for him, you know, seeing me and suggesting I play football and that friendship, you know, it's so funny, Dan, I'm, I'm sure in your life, too, when you look back at your life and when you get to our age, you get to be respect, reflective. There were little things that happened that ultimately completely changed the trajectory of your life. And Bona Davis being soaker was one and then getting talked into playing football and then kind of going from there. I loved uh, we started a fundraising tournament down here called the legacy and I would always bring Jim down. He was always my guest. And I loved it. He loved meeting my friends down here, my new life after football and all of the things we were doing. And they loved him. And uh, in fact, we give an award out every tournament. We call it the Jim Soaker Award, for the one that is most like Jim, that cares about people, is a servant heart, but he's a doer, he's a competitor, wants to win, but, but he wants to win the right way. So um, it's fond memories, I think, of Jim. Let's go back to your Charger days when you're go back to the four questions I'm interested you're weighing 127 pounds and obviously everybody well at least my age remembers you walking back as the honorary captain and I'm interested how the culture and how the situation occurred that allowed you maybe it was those four questions and others to actually re-emerge and be all pro and charge your hall of fame and do all those other wonderful things well they, they, that didn't just happen. I, again, I was, uh, when I, because I was still under contract, I, I could still go back to the facility and I could get treatment and we had a strength coach. So this is another one of those people that changed my life. A guy named Phil Tyne, who quite literally, you know, took me under his wing and nursed me back to health. I mean, I couldn't curl five pounds. I couldn't run a hundred yards. I was 125 pounds and he started to nurse me back to health. And with the disease colon out and my, my health starting to return, I was young, my body recovered. And then, but I had bags on my side. I was trying to figure out what to do from a job. I took a job as a color commentator for the soccers and thinking, all right, what am I gonna do now that I'm out of football? But as I got better, 
about a month before training camp. I never thought I was going to play again. He said, do you think you can kick? I go, I don't know. So we grabbed some footballs. We went out in the practice field. And I started to crush it. But more importantly, my bag stayed on. And I go, I wonder if I can do this. So I called a meeting with our owner at the time. His name was Gene Klein. And I said, you know, Mr. Klein, you're going to be in the playoffs. You need a kicker. Will you just allow me to compete for my job? No, no special dispensation. I'd received an incredible outpouring of support and love from our community. Our community loved the Chargers and our coach was from San Diego State. You know, as I mentioned, we had this amazing offense. We had these players that everybody connected with. And, and when one of them, me, got sick, the town just, I had thousands of letters and cards and flowers and prayers set for me and blood donated for me. And I said, I appreciate that coach or owner, but just treat me like, will you just allow me to compete? And he could have said that. He could have said, you know, Rolf, thanks. It's been nice. There are a hundred kickers in line. And by the way, none of them have ostomy bags, but he didn't. He said, if, if you can prove to the medical staff that you can protect yourself, we'd love for you to try out, go talk to coach Coriel. Had the same conversation with coaches. Oh, sure. Go and love to. And I got to compete for my job. And again, once you choose bitter or better, when you choose to better, the door starts to open. Here's how the door opened. Back then, there were, at this time, there were four preseason games. In our third preseason game, we're playing in LA against the Rams, 30 seconds left in the half, and it's a 55 yard field goal. And Coach Coria goes, punt team. And he walks away. But I'm standing next to the special teams coach. He goes, Well, can you make this? I go, I can make this. So he goes, Field goal team. So the field goal team goes right out there. We're halfway out and, and we all hear Coach Coriel, I said punt team, but it was too late. We're, we're lining up for the field goal. And we make the field goal. It'd be the longest kick in my career. It's a 55 yard field goal. And it was almost like, you know, treat this kicker like a kicker, not a injured former was. Had. And I got to play again and played seven more seasons after that. Amazing, Crazy. amazing story. You know, it says in the good book, humility before honor. And I always think about that. And uh, it, we talk to our guys about the hero's journey. It's a literary thing from Campbell and just how you get down into the abyss, you know, and then the abyss really is the, the power that moves you. And I'm, I'm interested in, uh, I think you're probably along this way, but and just how you found your way into your current life now and become so much of a giving and servant heart and being able to help transform. I'm interested in that journey of how that's transpired. You know, that's another really thoughtful question. There's actually a book I read that describes it well. It's called Second Mountain. So most of us, you know, leave college and we go conquer our first mountain, whatever. So I'm going to be a lawyer, doctor. I'm going to, you know, sell my company for a million bucks. I'm going to be a and we start climbing that mountain. And some of us make it to the top. You know, we win a Super Bowl. We look around and we go, is this all there is to it? How can that be that feeling? Some of us get knocked off that mountain for something stupid that we do. Sometimes life knocks you off that mountain, as in my case with my illness, and you end up in this valley. And in this valley, you wrestle with life. And some people never make it out of the valley. And some, get called to a second mountain. And the second mountain is a journey that is not so much conquering the mountain, it's getting involved in something bigger than yourself. It's a calling. It's, it's a response to the things that you have gone through that direct you to this place where you get fulfilled by the relationships you make along the way, by the opportunity you feel that you can do good with. And I would say that happened to me. I, I got called into this second mountain around health. And it was in direct response to the inadvertent, all of a sudden being this poster boy, if you will, for ostomy surgery, which I was embarrassed about. I did, I was single. I was, I was not the kind of thing you put on your calling card. But I started to realize the pain that every one of us goes through. And I wanted to make them know that yes, there is pain, but the outcome is amazing. It's, it can be like a really difficult chapter in an amazing book. 
And your life can be that if you're willing to get through this pain. And so that sort of started me on this second mountain, if you will, of, of being able to redirect the attention on me to the plight of people that I really had a broken heart for. And I'm still doing that. And it's the most humbling thing in the world. I, I, you know, I, I wrote a book, you know, I wrote my, my autobiography, Alive and Kicking. But then I wrote, you know, two other books. This is Great Comebacks from Ostomy Surgery. And this is uh, a compilation of 12 stories of people who didn't just survive, but they, they did return to what they love to do. They returned to the firefighter force, or they became police officers again, or they, one guy climbed Mount Everest with an ileostomy bag. They became triathletes. They became politicians, professional athletes. Al Guyver has an ostomy. And I, I, I wrote a second book, Embracing Life, which is another compilation. Because at the end of the day, these books became the hope that every patient needed to dig deep and discover this indomitable spirit and get back to whatever it is they wanted to do. And I, to this day, I speak to two or three patients a week and it's honestly the most humbling, satisfying thing that I do. We'll never make it to the top of this mountain, but the journey, the, the joy of the journey is what it becomes about. It's not the destination. So. You articulated it really well. Are you going to expand this mountain or create another mountain or what's your, what's your next journey? Well, I'm, I'm doing that now. Um, I'm creating a new way to do this. We're really creating an app that I'm working with the American College of Surgeons. There are 100 to 120,000 ostomy surgeries a year. My goal is that nobody goes through this alone. So we're creating an app that literally holds the hand of the patient through, I'm arbitrarily saying the six month journey. These patients, and like a lot of patients, there's three different journeys they go through at the same time. There's the physical surgery, which is painful, very painful potentially. There's the mechanical, how does your new digestion work? How do these bags work? Where do you get them? How do you take care of them? And then there's the difficult emotional journey. How do I return to things I love to do? How do I travel? Can I swim? Can I ever be intimate again? What about playing sports? All of which is absolutely the case. But you don't know that when you're kind of staring up at the ceiling tiles lying in their hospital bed going, oh my gosh, my life was just fundamentally changed. And these stories demonstrate that yes, changed, but for the, for the better, you, you get to live your life with this new wisdom that you gain through this difficult experience if you choose to. I'm interested and I don't know, did you meet your wife after you had went through this? So this... <laughs> So I met my us, wife. Walk us through that. Well, it's an interesting story. So after my illness, <clears throat> um, so I met, so after my illness, um, I went to the children's hospital. It was on my way home from practice. And I quietly went to somebody there. I said, look, I want to come here every Monday after practice. And I want to visit kids that have been ill, injured, whatever. I don't want you to tell anybody. I don't want this to be in the press. I want to do this as much for me as for these kids. So literally every Monday after practice, ever since my illness, I stopped at Children's Hospital and visited these kids. And there was a little girl that I fell in love with. She was 12 years old. She'd uh, fallen off a horse. She had a head injury. She couldn't be very well. But she had this wry sense of humor, and she was a huge Charger fan. So I visited her for about three months. The season ends. I go. She ends up going home. Three years later, the week I'm traded at the end of my career to Dallas, and then I subsequently decided to retire, I meet my wife at an outdoor street fair. She was with some friends, and I was with some friends, and she, when we were in here, she goes, I know you. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know me. <laughs> she goes, you used to visit a girl in the hospital that had a head injury. I'm going, how would you know? She goes, I was her speech pathologist, and all she would ever talk about was this charger that would come to visit her with this crazy name, and it's you. So that was the only thing that gave me a chance with Mary, because <laughs> she was not a huge fan of athletes. And so I was traded, came back, um, you know, and, and retired a month later, and looked her up in the phone book and asked her out, and that was how we got started. But it was because of that little crazy uh, meeting of, of, of this beautiful, cute little girl. 
Yeah. yeah. And now, now you're into parenting. I think you have four kids. Is that right? I mean, just talk to me about some of your foundations as a parent after all the things you went through. So I, as I jokingly say, I outkicked my coverage with my wife. I have really an extraordinary wife. She's, um, first of all, she's beautiful, but she's incredibly kind, uh, selfless, um, just loves people and uh, very strong. Um, we started to have kids and uh, we had a difficult time. We had multiple miscarriages, had a stillborn. We ended up having a girl prematurely, a two pounder who spends two and a half months in the NICU and She's, uh, she had a head injury, unfortunately, for its mild cerebral palsy. So we dealt a, a difficult child to raise, but it was unbelievable and it's changed both of us. And then we, long story short, we ended up adopting two boys from Russia when they were five and three. And they actually came more injured than we thought. So we've had some travails um, parenting them. And then we God gave him this little healthy boy who, Literally just graduated uh, a few weeks ago from uh, TCU. Wow. And um, so we have a horn frog, almost went to Davis, but he wanted to go do his own thing. And respect him for, he ended up at TCU, uh, former Davis coach there, um, worked with Soap for a little while. So we have four, three with special needs, and, and uh, just feel incredibly fortunate to have been the parents that we got to be. So what, what does the discussion of the current Rolf Benerska to the young Rolf Benerska. I'm interested in what that discussion, if those two people could be in a room, what would, what would the current guy tell the young guy? So that's a, another good question. I, I think what I would say is I initially had insecurity around what I did. So I, I got a great chance to play football. It opened up this whole new world. And I had an agent named Lee Steinberg. Do you oh, know yeah. Lee Steinberg? I was his third client. I was a nobody. His first client was Steve Bartkowski, number one draft choice back in 1976. And then, of course, Lee became sort of the pinnacle of agents. They did Jerry Maguire around him, and he was really the person. And then he kind of lost his way, became an alcoholic, and went through his own dark time and came back. He's now nine or ten years sober, and he's now back. Mahomes is his client, Tui Tagovola is his client, who's back on the rise, and he's changed as a result. I mean, he's so proud of him. But he's taught me that I should get involved with the community and learn to public speak, <clears throat> which I'd never done. So after my, my rookie year with the Chargers, I went to them in the offseason, and every time I said, look, if somebody wants a Charger to do something, you know, think about me. So I spoke at junior highs and rotary clubs and Kiwanas and Special Olympics and got to where I could tell a story, make a point, but, but I really got to meet the people that ran our community. They were involved in these organizations and built friendships that were authentic. They, they got to know me and I got to know them and I learned, you know, sports makes little boys out of these really successful men. And so they became sort of this safety net for me. But when I left sports, I had an insecurity around, what am I? I'm just sort of an old broken down football player. I didn't have a business degree, I had a science degree, but I'd been exposed to business and this other part of, of life, different from the academic medical side that I was raised in. And if I would write back, I would, I would say, you were more qualified and more capable than you knew, given all of the experiences that you have gone through. And it's taken me a while to learn that. So when I launched this company, I didn't have any business background. I launched it based on passion and desire and commitment to learn. And I got great people around me. And now we've built this company and we're having a huge impact on healthcare and patients particularly. And along the way, I was told by a lot of people, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're doing. And I said, maybe not, but I do know this. I know what patients need and what they want. And if we can give it to them, we can build extraordinary relationships with them and make a difference. And back then we talked about the need to be patient centric as an organization. I mean, even in healthcare, if you think about pharma companies, they work for patients and not really with patients. I'm going, you guys are missing the wisdom of these patients who want to come in and tell you. Well, back then nobody could spell patient centricity, let alone define it. Well, today that's what everybody's talking about. It's like diversity. We've talked about the importance of, of talking differently to different kinds of patients for 12 years. 
pushing this boulder up the hill. And now we're sort of subject matter experts because that's what our life's about. And I've gained confidence along the way as a result of that. So I wish I could go back and tell my younger self, believe in yourself, follow your passion. You have a great upbringing, you got a great base at Davis, go. And I think, um, Dan, I know you do that with your, your athletes. I think what Kevin's doing in the athletic department about preparing their athletes for the future is critical. I would suggest, heresy, that there's no professional sport that's really worth striving for. Even if you make it, you're lucky and it's 10 years, but then you, you got the rest of your life and you're 10 years, 10 years behind your, your peers. So athletics is such a great training to learn to discipline yourself, sacrifice for others, play in a team environment, give and take and get along with different people. And those attributes are extraordinarily valuable going forward, much more valuable than winning a title or going to play professionally. So I love the way Davis is focusing on treating the whole person, not just the athlete, and, and training into them these other attributes that will make them successful in life that I didn't really get a chance to have trained into me. I, I had to learn sort of by trial and error along the way. Well, you'd be proud because this morning I was out at the Jim Soaker statue and we'd kind of do these Zoom uh, recruiting meetings with guys. And so I was talking about the foundation of what coach had developed here. And I, there's very few coaches, as you all know, it doesn't matter high school, junior college, pro, almost every Davis coach has had a pretty solid book of, of, of uh, success. And it all kind of started there. But then behind him was a backhoe digging up our new facility. So it's kind of the kind of the new era um, I saw it yeah yeah it's I the just, foundation it's the foundation yeah. that was laid for you and now you get to lay it for the next generation and it's built on the same stuff right trust unity together we we always talk about davis guy and it's so hard to sum that up in just a short you know i i don't know if you were like this i know when i left here they kind of go oh yeah we went to davis oh davis guy like they just yeah. sort of get like this guy's a little different this yeah. guy's a little big picture thinker so uh, hey, Rolf, just a ton of respect for you. Um, I always think of excellence with class, and you definitely uh, define that. And certainly if uh, Mark Honbo asked me before we got on, he goes, hey, you, you know Rolf well? I said, well, I, don't, I wouldn't say that I know him well, but I do know him, and I certainly know of him well. Um, but a great inspiration to us and me and a uh, great legacy here and always humbling to see the work that you're doing, and it makes me think about, my job, so it's the old iron sharpens iron, but a uh, ton of respect for you. Thanks for spending some time with us and a lot of, a lot of good wisdom for a lot of people in that, in that hour show right there. Thanks, Dan. I, you know, honestly, it's a, it's a privilege. I, it's on the backs of others, I think, that we get to wherever we are. And it starts with a lot of anonymous people that we didn't have a time even to talk about, but they know who they are. We, we make a point of thanking them, but one obviously is Coach Soaker and your athletes and your students will tell you that about you um, in the years to come. And what I always appreciate about Jim, you know, he, he knew my wife and he knew my kids and he always asked about them. It, it wasn't just sports, it was the whole person. And the journey is what it's about. It's, it's not a destination, it's the journey. And we got a great start at Davis and you're leading a great group there. So keep it up, we're really proud of you. Yeah, proud to do it. Thanks a lot, Rolf. Take care. Yeah. Okay, Peace. great. Thank Thanks, you. Bye.